Ever wondered what you can get done in seven days? You could go on a nice break to the Lake District, read the first half of a series of Song and Ice and Fire, do all the things Craig David did in that song he wrote in the year 2000. Or you could just do what I do most weeks and doom scroll through existential dread. Hello everyone and Happy New Year! My name is Dumbways to Kai and welcome back to another installment of the worst survival game ever. A series where I am going to do my best to play every survival game in the hopes of finding the worst one. After some recommendations from you on my previous videos, I have chosen to do this episode on the FP PS Tower Defense Survival Horror Zombie RPG 7 Days to Die. Having never played it before, the 38 consecutive hours I put into this video left me with some mixed feelings. A day and a half of a game might not sound like a lot, but for this one it was more than enough. I might be full of hate, but I'm also full of knowledge of why I hate it. I don't think it was an inherently bad game, and it definitely has potential, I just didn't enjoy where it's at right now, and where it has been for the last few years. So without further non-contextual ranting, let's get to it. First, let's have a look at the developer, The Fun Pimps. The Fun Pimps are a small group of game and software developers based in Texas, and have spent the last 10 years working on their only release, Seven Days to Die, which is still firmly in alpha, and recently celebrated its 10 year in early access anniversary. I'm not sure that's something to be celebrated, but I respect the enthusiasm. The average Seven Days to Die team member has 14 years of experience in game and software development, with at least 10 of those years being dedicated to Seven Days to Die, no doubt. I won't criticise the slow development too much, especially since The Fun Pimps have been actively and continuously updating and working on the game. And I know absolutely nothing about game development, as I am but a simple YouTuber trying to make his way in these pixelated worlds, and 10 years in alpha being constantly worked on and only working on this one game, putting this much dedication into quality over quantity? I'm sure we're in for a real content pack treat. Seven Days to Die is an open-world, voxel-based sandbox game that is a mix of first-person shooter, survival horror, tower defense RPG that combines combat, crafting, looting, mining, exploration, and character growth. The worlds are also procedurally generated, but all of the buildings are handmade and remain consistent. So I guess if you throw enough sticky genres at a wall, something is eventually going to stick. The game takes place in the fictional county of Navasgain, Arizona. And yes, I absolutely had to look it up and check that it wasn't actually a real place. Niche American towns aren't at the top of my random trivial knowledge. And from random newspaper clippings strewn about the map, you can deduce that the zombie outbreak came from either the fallout from a nuclear war, a mutated influenza epidemic, or a nice healthy mix of both of these world raw dogging incidents. The basic premise of the game is that every seven days you are going to be attacked by a horde of zombies which progressively get more difficult the longer you survive. The days between these zombie raids are filled with base building, looting, crafting, gaining XP to boost various skills, trader quests, and the general stuff you expect from a survival game. It's currently on PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation PlayStation 4, but for now I'm going to be focusing on the PC release, which as of making this video is on sale for £4.55, but usually retails at £18.99, or 4.5 mil deals. So let's dive in and see whether 7 Days to Die is worth giving up 4.5 reasonably priced lunches for. The title screen is straightforward and easy to navigate, allowing you to customise and edit your world through the editing tools. There seems to be a lot of detailed tools here to tailor every aspect of your playthrough, and I like having the ability to tweak the settings to my own desired playstyle. It keeps things fresh and gives the game an opportunity not to stagnate. I'm going to stick to the bare bones basic settings to play the game as the developers set it out to be played. Initially I thought you couldn't customise your own character and I got a bit upset at that fact. It turns out 7 Days to Die does have a character creation option, but it's annoyingly hidden. Having to go into options, then play a profile, and then create. Why isn't it just at the start of a new game selection? Like genuinely, any game in the history of games that has character creation menu has rightfully put it as the first thing you do after you click new game. So to put it anywhere else just seems odd? It very much falls under the category of, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Either way, I created my character and named it after the very endearing nickname Josh Strife Hayes gave me in his latest worst MMO ever video, Mr. Dumb. In terms of the character creation, it's okay. A few uninspiring choices on the hair and a classic slider feature on every body part, which naturally I max all the way out and then load into the game. You spawn in a random location on the map. The game begins with a pretty rudimentary tutorial, going through the motions to craft a bedroll, basic crafting and gathering materials such as an axe, and showing you which items you will need to craft each thing, which during the tutorial are highlighted for your convenience. This is a really nice touch, as item textures can vary massively across games and without knowing what you're looking for, it can sometimes end up taking hours to search for what you need. The user interface is pretty standard for a survival game. Nice and tidy, with a compass at the top and the day and time displayed underneath so you can keep track of when night time is approaching. This is going to be really important when we go and run errands. It didn't take long before I came across my first enemy, an undead vulture. It seems humans weren't the only thing affected by the world ending event. The combat seems really clunky and a bit all over the place, but I'm not going to judge it based off this one interaction. I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunities to test out the game's combat system, and given the various different skills available to upgrade, it seems this can vary massively depending on how you play the game. 
game. Having a quick pause break, I noticed something I hadn't seen before. Seven Days to Die offers Twitch integration. Heavily curious for the sake of more content, I looked into this, which the fun pimps have lovingly put into a PDF for all of us to enjoy. Twitch integration allows your chat to spend pimp points that they generate whilst chatting in stream, which they can use to prolong or hinder your survival. You can check your points anytime using the hashtag CP, although I argue that is not the best abbreviation to use ever. This seems like a potentially fun way to play the game and interact with your viewers as well, and I'd love to see this in action. So with the tutorial mostly out of the way, I set up my bedroll on a nearby Firewatch tower, having to battle my way through a few of the undead in the process. I'm not sure if it's too early for me to judge, but the zombie's movement seems really awkward and lazily animated. I really don't want to be too critical, but with 10 years of development, there's definitely certain things I would prioritise, such as making the main focus of the game not look like decomposing marionette puppets. I found at this stage that bow and arrows are best for fending off the undead, so I set out trying to gather as many feathers as possible, which you can get out of bird's nests that are found only on the ground. Now you could reason this is lazy game design, but I have a redeeming theory. During the nuclear apocalypse, the resulting shock waves from the nukes blew all of the bird's nests out of the trees and onto the floor, killing all the birds but keeping the eggs well preserved. So when the new birds hatched, they saw all of the nests on the floor and just assumed that's where and how they were supposed to build nests. There you go, fun pimps. You can have that one on me. It didn't take long before I was concussed by a zombird, showcasing the variously extensive negative status effects in this game that can hinder your chances of survival. From concussions to broken limbs to infection and exhaustion, all of which will debuff you and have a drastic effect on your health and stamina. There honestly isn't much limit to how messed up you can get in seven days to die. Being tasked with making my way to the trader, I decided to leave my current camp and go forth and explore. To venture here is not without challenge, it appears, as I noticed in the status bar on the left hand side of the screen that I have been infected, no doubt by the bird that concussed me earlier. I'm not sure at the moment how long it takes to succumb to it or what being infected means, but I can definitely hazard a guess. I got to the trader without much incident other than a zombie that was unlucky enough to be in my way and battering a helpless but definitely evil chicken. And it seems like he's built a pretty fortified complex for himself here with a big threatening sign that says if you loot I shoot. Seeing as that won't stop me because I can't read I proceeded to loot the place dry of anything that I could and he did absolutely nothing to stop me. So having zero consequences for my actions I sold all of his items back to him and did not feel bad about it in the slightest. Capitalism one, lonely trader man zero. Speaking to the trader shows that he has a couple of options to either browse his wares or take on various jobs from him, which come in the form of either clear zombie quests or fetch quests, and I'm sure that won't get tedious at any point. Jobs are used to gain XP and rewards to help you progress through the game. You also earn money to buy things from the trader's inventory. Seeing as my old base was over a kilometre away and I am inherently lazy, I have chosen to relocate directly next door for my convenience. It was at this point I noticed I had four whole skill points to spend. This would have been great to know earlier, and I'm not sure whether I wasn't paying attention or if the game just didn't notify me at all. There are a multitude of skills you can level up in various combinations depending on how you want to play the game. This itself can work really well in multiplayer, as if you have a good group with a specific set of skills, each of you can all focus on different tasks and lengthen your chances of survival. But seeing as I have no friends and I'm playing this all by myself, I'm going to put my skill points in resource and health focused options. I set my eyes on gathering resources to build myself a fortress worthy of holding back the angriest horde, and whilst gathering enough wood to rebuild the ship of Theseus five times over, I noticed something special in my inventory. An oak seed. Oak seed. If only there were another name for that. A specific but very commonly known name for that item. One can dream. Building in 7 Days to Die is interesting as the developers chose to go with a voxel sandbox mechanic. For those of you that don't know, voxel mechanics refer to the use of voxels which is an abbreviation of volumetric pixels. Unlike traditional pixels which represent 2D points on a screen, voxels represent 3D cubes in a spatial grid. The best example of voxel mechanics are the mining and crafting in Minecraft. It's definitely an interesting choice for this genre and one I admittedly wasn't massively keen on to begin begin with, but it definitely grew on me. The game also gives you a multitude of different styles and options for the crafting blocks too, and if you hold down the R key you can scroll through these options. Although the game doesn't actually tell you this and I had to find out from a friend who's a pretty big fan of the game, I thought the best way to go about building was to go higher. So I started putting up a house on stilts, but it wasn't long before the whole thing came crashing down. Although having it start highlighting itself in red should have been a very obvious sign that things weren't okay so more fool me. I personally don't think this building style fits the feel of the game for me. Whatever you build doesn't seem to fit in with the rest of the environment, and as a result feels incredibly out of place. It hit 10pm and the traders closed down with a loud announcement, but I managed to build myself a rudimentary raised cabin with a single access bridge, so this should keep me safe for now. I waited in my cabin for the night to pass as the zombies really ramp up their ferocity at night, like sprinting towards me the second they locked eyes. This, along with the added terrifying environmental sounds, made me stay firmly where I deemed myself safe, but as the sun rose and the threat level decreased, 
least, I thought it best to get some tasks done and some resources gathered. One thing that's really hindering me though is the thirst level. I'm thirsty and I can't seem to find fresh water anywhere. Like literally, it's either nowhere or the minimal water I do find is filthy and will make my insides fall out from underneath me very quickly. Look, food and drink mechanics are great and are, in my opinion, one of the important staples of any survival game, but I definitely feel like there should be a good balance between needing these resources and the availability of finding these resources. Unless the goal of the game is to primarily survive through the means of eating and drinking, then finding food and drink should never be the main focus or too punishing. The primary focus from what I can tell of Seven Days to Die is to build a strong enough base able to withstand a horde that comes and attacks you during the blood moon on the seventh day, so it seems like a monumental waste of effort to spend my time finding jars of filthy water and then spending more time figuring out how to get it clean. The fact stamina depletes a lot quicker when you're thirsty as well makes the simplest of tasks an absolute ball ache. Seeing as I'm using a lot of wood to build my base, I decided to plant my oak seeds, and then after that I proceeded to go and mine some iron with my stone whacker and put it safely in my leather holder. If the fun pimps get to rename basic things, then so do I and I'm going to continue throughout the duration of this video. But either way, it's nice that the trees drop seeds for you to plant. This means my in-game carbon footprint could be a neat net zero if desired. And infection update, we're now sitting at 14%. Nothing has happened, but it's now red, a famously bad news colour. I took my first job from the trader, which happened to be a clear zombie quest, followed the marker and found the area indicated by a huge conspicuous flashing exclamation mark. Then I started clearing them out, adopting the age-old Skyrim technique of being a stealth archer, mainly because of the damage bonus. It's great how arrows hit so much harder if your target is unaware of where they're being fired from. Once they were all well and truly dead, I raided the place, found some very snazzy cowboy boots, and made my way back to the trader to get my reward of... a bunch of wood. And I continued to go through the available jobs. Many jobs finished, and many more houses cleared, I'm still no closer to finding any water, but I did get bitten by a snake, so it's nice to know zombies aren't the only thing I have to be worried about. Finally, I found some murky water. Now I have to figure out how to clean it and make it drinkable. I'm all up for the idea of having to figure things out for yourself, but some general direction into the game's core mechanics would be good. I hope you're taking notes. To make water drinkable, you have to buy a cooking pot from the trader. This is also used to cook charred meat, which to make one of, you have to have five lots of raw meat. That is the most disproportionate crafting ratio I have ever seen. Five raw to one cooked meat. Make it make sense. Imagine buying a five pack of chicken from Tesco's just to make one small and slightly burnt chicken burger. You're either a horrendous cook going through a lot of trial and error, or you're in a bad video game. Either way, someone's going to go hungry. And just when I thought hunger, thirst, and infection couldn't get any worse, due to the lack of finding any form of clothing, I started freezing to death. So I made a quick fire and went and sat by it, only to abruptly burst into flames. I can't catch a break. Like a room full of grief-stricken psychics, there are quite literally zero happy mediums in this game. After putting myself out and tending to my burns, I spent the night building walls around my cabin, thinking that if I do enough of these, I may just be able to survive the blood moon. It worked on Attack on Titan, right? The hunger really started to affect me, so I rummaged everywhere for a scrap of food and eventually found some, in the form of an old sham sandwich in the trash, which I chowed down on, contracting dysentery almost immediately. Which is... fair enough. I can't even argue against that. I ate a trash sandwich. What did I expect? Just about managing to clear out the third house, I started hobbling back to the trader to collect my reward. Hungry, thirsty, infected, and quite literally shitting myself, the reality of my upcoming demise was setting in. I knew I wasn't going to make it much longer. I decided to go out on my own terms in a literal blaze of glory, and I will say, it took a hauntingly long time to burn to death. I definitely wouldn't recommend it. When I did finally die, it dawned on me. The game is called Seven Days to Die, and I died well before that. Does that mean I've won the game? I'm the best survival game player ever. Well, apparently that isn't the goal of the game, so the title's very misleading. Should maybe go for seven days to not die, seeing as that's the whole point. I was quite happy to see a different kind of fetch quest that involved digging, which ended up being pretty tedious, but I will say the digging physics are cool. I really like the ability to pretty much completely manipulate the environment. It opens up a ton of different avenues for you to explore when it comes to building your base. Speaking of which, the way you have to upgrade buildings in this is pretty excruciating. If you want to upgrade to cobblestone, you must first upgrade them all to wood. One block at a time, each taking a few smacks of my stone whacker. If you have a big base, this would take an insane amount of time and resources for a single player run. It's unnecessary how long it takes. There are so many different great ways you can upgrade base material, and this definitely isn't one of them. Not for me anyway. I'm going to keep everything at the base material now. I'll consider upgrading later. Time was running out and I wanted to build a maze leading to the entrance of my base. My thinking is that this will slow down and funnel the horde onto my bridge, making it easier to pick them off. This is my theory anyway. So it appears we can't place blocks over white road markings. 
The collision detection in this game is wild, but smashing it with a sledgehammer just shows the painted white lines take up an entire voxel cube's worth of space. So instead of creating a road cube with the painted line as its own texture, they created the line texture on an invisible cube and thought that was okay. Cool, looks like I'm spending my night smashing lines with my sledgehammer. Over the coming days, I was killed by a pack of wolves, punched a chicken, did a couple more fetch quests, and found some dirty water in a perfectly working fridge. Seriously, why is clean water so difficult to find? I also found and picked up an airdrop with some semi-useful bits in it. I'm not sure who's wasting aircraft fuel to drop off pies and magazines, but the sentiment is definitely appreciated. It was at this point I experienced a bug that I would consider game ruining, and if it wasn't for the fact I'd done so much already, I would have started again. I loaded into the game and it reset my timer back to day one with zero explanation, and all of my stuff was still here. Currently seeing this as more of a blessing than a curse, but also an incredibly unfair advantage, because I'm now playing day one, with an established base and a fair few unlocked skills. Now usually I'd keep integrity strong in my videos and restart and do a fair playthrough, but I'm absolutely not playing this game from the beginning again. So we're going to carry on with the hand we've been dealt here, and I'm sure a few of you will enjoy moaning at me in the comments about that. Nevertheless, I carried on clearing houses and found an AK-47 after spending about 20 minutes smashing open a lockbox with my sledgehammer. Well earned in my opinion. Getting back to the trader, he rewarded me with a bike. The world is now truly my oyster, as walking everywhere was starting to get really old. I spent this time building up my base and taking on every job that I could. I'm really struggling to find any enjoyment with carrying on with this at this point. Every single job is a fetch quest or a clear quest. There is zero substance to it. No meaning. Engaging games give you a reason to want to go and do these things. It's much more captivating if there's a motive behind the player's actions. Why do you need me to clear this house? You stay here in your fortress all day, every day. Me clearing one building changes nothing. I'm really having a difficult time staying engaged with this at all. But I persevered, using the money and rewards from the jobs to upgrade my base to a good potential and finally the blood moon rose from the horizon. The day I've been working so hard towards is finally here and I'm ready. I set myself up for the horde to come, and it was insanely underwhelming. Seriously, is that it? All of that time? All of those pointlessly mundane fetch quests? For that? I know it's only the first Blood Moon, and I'm sure they get a lot more challenging. I know I basically used the bug to my advantage, so I shouldn't be too harsh with it, it just felt like my efforts were somewhat wasted. But remembering how customizable the game can be, I decided to ramp up the Blood Moon settings to max and give it another crack. This time was definitely more fun and worthy of the fortress and arsenal I built up for myself. My god did my base take one hell of a beating. I can definitely see that if you're playing a completely bare playthrough, then the level the Blood Moon is at would be a decent challenge. And honestly, I am looking forward to seeing where Seven Days to Die is going to be in the future. I really hope they add a level of story element to it. This could be a really amazing survival game if it just added motive or purpose. Currently, it really doesn't have much motivation for me to carry on playing. Maybe we'll come back to this one when it's finally out of early access, but until then, it's going to go back to gathering virtual dust on my Steam library shelf. Thank you so much for watching, and if you made it this far and like what you see, hit that like and subscribe button. And if you really like what you see, why not consider becoming a member? I have no idea what extra benefits this gives you, but it lets me buy the nice top shelf coffee. I've been Dumbwaste Kai, happy new year, and see you all in the next worst survival game ever. Bye for now.